Hello. <laughs> it's okay. Hi. Um, thanks so much for coming. Really excited to have you all here and uh, spend the afternoon with us. Um, I'm Malte from. Uh, now it's working. Uh, from Facebook, uh, I'm from the Berlin office. I'm a strategic partnerships manager. And um, I'm basically um, yeah, just doing the introduction, and then we'll have a bunch of speakers talking more about uh, specific things. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about tools and programs and, uh, and really um, trying to uh, tell you how, you how we can help you grow your business and, and scale it on top of our platforms. So um, back in 2007, we, um, we looked into um, how, how can we enable the tech community, how we can help them uh, b build on top of the Facebook platform. And this is, um, this is literally why we built the, uh, started the Facebook platform in 2007. Um, and um, when we first launched, there were only 24 million people on Facebook. And um, today, there's more than 2 billion people using, who are using Facebook. And um, as you know, in a world of apps and mobility, we look at the journey that startups and uh, entrepreneurs like you go through to build and, uh, and scale strong businesses. And this is uh, something we'd really like to support you with. Um, and uh, how do you grow a business? Um, it all starts with dissecting the customer journey. And um, at Facebook, um, we, we learned that uh, there's no one-size-fits-all uh, one solution. And, um, and you have to basically be ready for, for any, any entry point. You really have to optimize for all kinds of different use cases. And it's something that we learned uh, across our journey, across uh, when we grew to, to the 2 billion users. Um, and um, basically, um, yeah, so, so there's, there's a few different touch points. The first one, obviously, is onboarding. Um, this is where, where your business starts connecting with, uh, with users. This is where we want to provide a frictionless experience for everybody. Next topic we'll talk about today is growth. Letting p people discover your app and, uh, and help you drive installs, drive, uh, drive adoption, drive users. Um, engagement. Another challenge that uh, businesses have is keep people engaged. And uh, we would like to help you and enable, uh, to, we would like to enable you to have a direct line to your customers, to um, have a direct com line of communication with them on a daily basis. Um, another topic we'll talk about is uh, how do you build a sustainable business? How do you actually make money? How do you make money globally? And then um, also um, measurement. Basically, um, we want to help you understand uh, your customer behavior. How, how do they move through the funnel? How do they interact with your product up to the, uh, um, the, the full path of, of purchase um, to, help you, to help you grow your business and actually be able to, to be sustainable. These are the key touch points in the customer journey for f and at Facebook as well. And, um, and this is something uh, I'd like to talk about more. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, do a little bit of a deep dive into uh, a little bit of uh, more details about the specific things, and then uh, we continue with the other speakers. So first of all, uh, first touch point. Um, is it on there? Yeah, perfect. Cool. Um, so. You know, um, whether it's creating an account or visiting your store for the first time, you need to ke uh, keep, the, keep the experience frictionless. You have to make sure the users don't drop off. You have to make sure that they have the, the best experience possible. And uh, this is something where, while we, uh, this is the reason why we built Facebook Login, which, which lets you create, or lets a Facebook user create an account with your platform within just two taps. And also Account Kit, which um, uh, provides phone number and email login with no additional passwords to remember. And uh, you can even use those two together, which um, makes the experience even, 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 uh, uh, less, even, even more frictionless. Okay, and then uh, the next question is, how can you build awareness for your target audience? How can you actually really get in front of the people that matter to you, that you want to reach, that will keep coming back to your audience. And we want to help you to get the word out. We want to get people to be able to discover your apps. Um, next point is uh, growth. So two, two points here. As you know, sharing is a big thing for Facebook. And uh, we built the sharing tools to make it quick and simple for people to share content from your platforms, from your app, from your site, and uh, for you to recommend your site to friends to find uh, what you're working on. And obviously, also our Facebook app ads. Um, uh, they offer a significant scale um, to build significant scale along with high quality people to engage with your app. So you really know you reach the right people that will download your app, that will use your app, that will um, become long 
time customers. And uh, app ads allow you to grow um, your app, uh, reach a much larger audience than you would usually do just by, by um, yeah, based on your own platform. Um, and um, another thing um, that's, that's really important is how do you keep the users engaged? So one thing that uh, we introduced um, that way is open the uh, messenger platform. And this is what we'll also talk about today. How can you actually have uh, open line of communication and uh, gain feedback um, on your products on a daily basis? Um, oh, sorry. This, uh, skip the slide. Okay. So, yeah. So you can... Um, we will we'll also be sharing more on this later, and we also have an interesting update that uh, we can't share until 4 p.m., but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll make it in time. Um, and, um, and most importantly, uh, for a lot of you, is uh, how can we help you monetize your business? How can we um, help you earn money and engage with, uh, with, with more users? And this is where Audience Network comes in. We built this to, to empower you to do so. Audience Network creates valuable opportunities um, to deliver ads to real people across mobile apps and mobile websites. So it's a mobile-only product with access to demand of all the f uh, from Facebook's advertisers around the world. So it's a truly global product. And uh, yeah, it helps developers monetize through a variety of innovative and integrated ad experiences like display, video, and uh, native formats. And uh, finally, um, measurement. So it's important to understand and optimize your complete customer journey from origin to scale. And for that, um, we, we, we opened up Facebook Analytics to, to all our users. Um, it lets, really what, what Facebook Analytics does is uh, uh, it tracks people across multiple devices and channels when they're interacting with your business. So we, we try to unify people's behaviors across channels to provide you with a more accurate and deeper understanding of the actions that people take with your business. So not only looking at devices, but actually at the people behind it. Um, and um, also, beyond all the tools and platforms that we, that we have, we want to support developers and setups through programs like uh, FB Start, which you probably have known. It's been around for a while. We've done a bunch of FB Start events also here in Berlin. Um, and uh, newly uh, developer circles, which we launched uh, this year at F8 conference in April. And I'll tell you a little bit more about developer circles later on. And um, yeah, so Facebook uh, is a culture of builders. And uh, we've enabled ecosystems of builders across, across the globe and across very uh, diverse verticals to build on top of it. And our developer tools are built specifically to help you connect with your customers at different points throughout the journey. And um, and now we'll dive deeper into those subjects again. So we have uh, a bunch of uh, speakers from, from all around the world that will help you um, basically understand all those different subjects. First, we have Yeni, who just came from a similar event we did in, uh, in Seoul, Korea, uh, just a few days ago. And she will talk about uh, how to engage with the audience on the Messenger platform. Then we have uh, Stefan, um, a partner speaker from Mercury.ai. They built a successful MuggyBot, which maybe some of you know. And he will share some tips and tricks and also give you a partner's perspective on how it is to build on top of our platform. And um, Zemion, who's uh, from the Berlin office, he's a policy and privacy manager. And he will share some insights on how the upcoming EU general data protection regulation, or GDPR, is... Uh, well, some of you people know it by, um, might impact your business and what to plan for. It's actually a very timely, um, timely talk. And then uh, we'll have a short break. After that, Momo, will, um, who also came from, from California, will talk about how to use your platform to drive higher conversions and meaningful connections with your audience. Then we have Daniel from our Berlin office. He will share a few insights on our ad products, uh, the recent updates, and uh, what, we're, what we've been building there in the last few months. And um, then we have Matthias, also from our HQ in Menlo Park, and he will share insights on Facebook analytics and how to, optimize, how to use it to optimize your product and business. So I'm, uh, this is the end of my part. I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Jenny, who will talk more about uh, the Messenger platform. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Yenny, and I'm on the product partnerships team for Messenger. And I'm so excited to be here with you today to share what you can do to engage with your audience on Messenger. So before we begin, um, can I see a show of hands of who has Messenger? 
Great. So can you get out your phones and open? Can everyone get out their phones? Yep. Get open the Messenger app. Point to the parametric code, and let's get the bot started. Um, you can get information on the rest of the sessions that are happening today, office hour information, um, information about swag, and also how to give feedback. <clears throat> Oops, let me go back. Actually, doesn't seem like. Did everyone get this? Oh yeah, or the badge. <laughs> that would be efficient too. All right. I see some phones still, so I'm just going to give a second. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, it is on the badge too, as someone pointed out, so you can scan that too. It's estimated by next year, we're going to have two billion people around the world message. And in order to build the right platform, we wanted to learn more about people's behaviors on messaging apps. What we found was that people are messaging more than ever, and they expect that behavior to grow. When we surveyed people, 59% said that they're messaging now more than they did two years ago. And 56% expect that behavior to increase in the next couple of years. If we look at our own messaging behavior, this makes sense. Messenger makes it easy to reach just about anyone. You don't need their phone number, and you don't need to be friends with them on Facebook. Messenger has richer features than texting, from group video chat to making payments, a brand new camera, sharing stickers or gifts, or even chatting with your favorite brand or business. We see this exponential rise in messaging at Facebook as well. Today, there are over 1.3 billion users on Messenger. We see this as a part of a major consumer shift. There are now 70 million business pages on Facebook, and nearly 20 million of them are exchanging messages with people every month. Can you guess how many messages are exchanged between people and businesses per month? Does anyone want to make a guess? 20 million businesses, no? Yeah, who said that? Two billion messages, both people initiated um, as well as auto messages are being exchanged every month. And as more and more businesses move to a new channel, to this new channel, we're seeing further growth in messages from users. And as you might imagine, the preferences we have communicating with friends and family influence the, the preferences that we have communicating with businesses too. Close to two-thirds of people we surveyed by Nielsen, that were surveyed by Nielsen said that their messaging with businesses has increased over the past two years. And over half of those same people said that they're more likely to shop with a business that they can message directly. This behavior is growing, and we strongly recommend that businesses consider how messaging will play a role in their overall communication strategy with existing and potential customers. It's hard to believe this, but two years ago, we started the platform with zero developers and bots. Today, there are 100,000 developers on Messenger and Wit.ai, and an equal number of monthly active bots. It has been a great learning experience as we see more bot platforms and businesses build on Messenger. Bots have simplified many processes and provided great value to companies which is why we've seen so many of them build bots. Here are just a few of our, our partners and brands from Germany, such as Magi, Alliance, Swelly, and Mercedes, and around the world. Messenger allows you to create powerful, personal, personalized experiences that bring your brand to life and allow you to connect directly with your customers. 
whether it's delivering superior customer service, raising awareness for your brand, enabling transactions, or acquiring new customers, Messenger can be a part of that solution. Here's an example of a partner who's worked with us to drive outcomes for, for their business while engaging their customers in ways they've never done before. Tommy Hilfiger launched a chatbot on Facebook Messenger to tie in with its New York Fashion Week extravaganza. Named Tommy Girl, the service enabled personalized, scalable conversations with fans surrounding the brand's Fall 2016 line and its Tommy and Gigi collection. Created in partnership with artificial intelligence platform Message.ai, shoppers were styled by celebrity Gigi Hadid in the form of a chatbot. In addition to building brand awareness, we believe that Messenger allows you to reach and engage new customers that may not be fully engaged with traditional channels. Let's take a look at an example from France. Medic, a subsidiary of Match.com, created a bot called Lara, the first virtual assistant for dating. Through personalized conversations, Lara facilitates the creation of a Medic profile and presents users with best uh, matches based on their search criteria. During the first month of Medic's soft launch, thousands of conversations were started between the users and Lara. Businesses are starting to realize that Messenger enables one of the most direct and personal connections that they can have with their customers, making it an excellent channel for driving sales. I want to share another example of a partner who has effectively used conversational dynamics to convert interest into sales. Alliance France created a bot for Messenger to help people get insurance quotes in a fast and convenient way. On Messenger, it only takes a minute and a half to fill out all the necessary information, and then 30 minutes to obtain an insurance quote. Finally, there are two ways that people can get, um, complete a subscription either by phone or a callback. And this is my favorite topic, customer service. When it comes to customer service, one of the most important things that users care about is responsiveness. So building the capability to be responsive at scale is a very natural starting point for automation. KLM wanted it to make it easier for their customers and agents to have meaningful conversations without compromising privacy. So KLM knew that their customers were on Facebook and Messenger, um, but that people couldn't share sensitive travel information on the page. So they added the Send to Message button on their Facebook page, allowing people to quickly and privately communicate with their agents. They also added the Send to Messenger plugin on their website which gives people the option to receive flight, uh, flight information, booking confirmations, um, updates, check-in notifications, boarding passes. And what did their customers think about this experience on Messenger? Preliminary results reveal that KLM, KLM's Messenger service received the highest NPS compared to all of their other social channels. The Messenger platform is designed for the way you do business. One, it's conversational, so talk to people directly. Automate your interactions or do both. Two, it's visual. Show, don't tell. Express yourself using more than just words. Three, it's social. Create new connections by giving people the ability to share your bot. Now, I'll take this time to highlight a couple of great features that we have available on the platform today, which make it easier than ever for people to connect on Messenger. With account linking, you can connect your customers' accounts with Messenger accounts, enabling a deeper and more personal experience. Next, we have what's called persistent menu. Most bots have a common, uh, common menu or settings option. And we're now making this more consistent and easier to access. The persistent menu eliminates the need for people to remember text commands and provides a great way to restart the flow. 
Third on this slide is Quick Replies. Quick Replies offers a more guided experience for people as they interact with your bot and helps set expectations on what the bot can do. It includes 10 hand dynamic buttons um, that directly align with the most recent message sent by the business, making it easier to have an automated conversation with people. The number one request from the community that we got was to have a discovery surface. So earlier this year at F8, we launched Discover Tab, where you can have, uh, where we featured popular bots as well as categories to, big bot, to pick bots from. Chat extensions is another feature we announced at F8. We made changes to the composer and messenger, adding a drawer that's open when you press the plus button on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Chat extensions allows you to invite a bot into a conversation that you're already having with family and friends. So a group of friends can buy movie tickets, book reservations at a restaurant, or create a shared playlist on Spotify, all while having a conversation on Messenger. Oops. Sorry, I think there's something wrong here. So um, I'm going to talk about tips that I can share with you. Uh, the first one is what you don't want to do, which is death by decision tree. So what you see behind me is um, a travel demo. And it's basically asking the user a list of questions. Now imagine if you're the user and you're answering all of these questions and you make a mistake. It's all over, right? You don't get the travel quote that you want. Um, it's a horrible, horrible experience for the user. So what we are asking that you consider doing is making sure that uh, you, you avoid um, asking a list of questions. And if you're, oh, sorry, I'm having some issues, technical issues. If you have multiple inputs, then you consider web view. What is Swelly doing here well? Can anyone take a look and see what they're actually uh, taking advantage of here? They're asking multiple questions, and it's basically a checklist of options that they can choose from. So if you have multiple inputs that you need from the user, then we ask that you consider something like WebView. Um, it, it basically looks like a widget, and it's something that, that prevents you from, uh, from asking lots of questions and then going through the, the death by decision tree. OK. We talked earlier about the persistent menu. And here's a great example of the feature. This is the eBay shop bot. At a glance, you can see what the bot can do. There are only two things. You can browse collection, customize preferences. What's really nice about this persistent menu is that you can reset the flow at any time. Word of caution, just because you can now build nested menus doesn't mean that you should, that you should get overboard with this. The general rule of thumb is to figure out the main functionality you want to highlight and use a nested menu only when there's a natural next step after the top navigation flow. Also, you don't want to create a menu option called menu because it's redundant. If you want to give the user an ability to start over, just call it start over. Once your bot is live, you want your current and future customers to be aware of it. Um, so start thinking about ways that you can introduce your bot, uh, where there's already a lot of eyeballs. So this can be your website, so you can take advantage of the Send to Messenger plugin. Um, parametric codes, if you have a physical retail store, or the Facebook page. Then think about creating virality through sharing. So let me show you a couple of other great examples. TechCrunch. So where does TechCrunch get most of their traffic? It's their homepage. So they use the Send to Messenger plugin to drive traffic from their website to subscribe people on Messenger. We have extended sharing capabilities, too. So now you can customize the message that users send to their friend, like Trivia Blast has done here. 
Their custom message, can you beat me at Harry Potter, is shared, and then we'll, the link will deep link back to your bot, their bot. Finally, paid discovery through ads is an effective way to drive new traffic. Facebook is great at targeting specific audiences, as you guys probably already know this, and we have newsfeed ads to drive your traffic to your bot. When you need to re-engage people, sponsored messages allows you to send targeted updates or promotions to people who have already messaged your, your bot before. This is a great way to get people back to your bot after the 24 plus one period has passed. Remember, if you're already on Messenger, it's an incredible opportunity, and it's never been a better time to invest. We want to thank our awesome, awesome developer community. You guys are pioneers, and we can't wait to see what you build next. Next up, Stefan from Mercury.ai, who built this successful Magi bot, will share his experience building on the Messenger platform and share his tips. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks to the uh, Facebook um, platform team and the developer team for having me. It's uh, quite an honor to be here and talking to you guys. Um, yeah, well, Kim, which is um, Kitchen Intelligence uh, by Maggi, um, is built on our platform Mercury AI. Um, how many of you ask the question of what should I eat, what should I cook today on a daily basis? Well, that is uh, pretty much the numbers uh, we get from market polls. Basically, everybody does or has somebody who does it for himself, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So, um, and, and that is exactly that is the thing that um, Kim is intended to do. Kim asks, um, helps you um, find out um, inspiration around what to eat, what to, um, what to cook with ingredients you have, have at home. So, so you could ask Kim questions like, um, I still have an eggplant and onions in the fridge, but what can I cook with it? Or um, I want something spicy, spicy without rice, or I'm allergic to nuts, um, but uh, would like um, some um, granola. So, um, so all these kind of um, cooking-related topics you can, can talk to Kim about, and obviously, um, if, just like you might already guessed, this will turn out to be quite natural language-heavy and dialogue-heavy, not so much the the standard decision tree thing of dialogue we've seen in other bots. So um, maybe as a um, one line of advertising for Mercury, if you're planning to do natural language heavy, dialogue heavy bots, then um, just uh, shoot me a line. Um, that is exactly what companies ask us for, to, to build bots like this. And if, if um, in, in the following minutes, I just want to dive through a conversation with Kim and um, show some, some of the things we've, uh, we've learned during, um, during the project and um, that might be helpful for you guys um, in the future as well. Um, maybe just a note, um, we are sort of really a, a research spin-off, um, so we are really looking into these kind of dialogue things, um, not so much as... Um, as building these um, straight uh, dialogue tree kind of um, things. So, so I might have some aspects in there that are, are diverting from, from the typical make it like a simple click-through product. That are, those are really cool as well for bots and they work for a lot of cases. Just in our case, it's more dialogue um, oriented. So the law. Before we start with the bot, and basically before every of the users starts with the bot, um, they have to opt into um, storing the data because um, we're in Germany and this uh, stuff is a bit more regulated than in the US, but um, we had to learn this a bit of the hard way because um, in working with a large client like, like Nestle or Maggi is, um, you're not only working with the, with the marketing team, you always work with legal and um, if you are about, if you're um, into building cool new tech products, then um, maybe a, a, a takeaway from this will be embrace the other stakeholders, embrace legal. If you do that early on and find out what they need, you might have a, um, a much more relaxed time working on the cool stuff. So we did that. They were really cool and helpful in doing this, but in order for, like, to technically do this, basically build it just of a sort of a gate where you. Um, only pull the, the, the profile data from the users after they opt in and you're all safe. 
Oh, by the way, you can always see on the right side the, the dialogue as we, as we move through the conversation and not, not so much uh, address what is in there. I hope you are familiar with German um, well enough to, to read this. I guess you are. Um, okay, we, we, we had the menu already in the previous talk um, and um, I totally agree with what was said there. I consider the menu to be a safety net especially if you're in natural language conversations um, where you are not following a, a predefined flow of things, then the menu can be um, really sort of a, um, a fallback where users can resort to and, 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 and get back on track once they're lost. So sometimes you might run into a situation where you not really know what the bot can do or you need to reset or you need to address certain features that you otherwise wouldn't maybe even be aware of that they are existing in the bot. Um, for instance, in, in our case, we have the user profile in there where users can, can find out what the bot has, um, has memorized about them, so um, preferences in, in, in food tastes and all these kind of things, allergies and all this. And you can ask the bot about this as well in the dialogue, but also in the menu you can address this. Also within the um, um, Impressum Datenschutz area, you can not only um, look who's collecting your data, but all you, also you can... Um, you can delete all the data the bot knows about you, which is, I think, I mean, we will you will hear talk about um, um, data um, data regulations after mine, I guess. So this is something we will have to really look at in the, in the future. You can argue with that, but try to argue uh, about that with a large company. I think you have to just accept that things are that way, right? And um, if in our case, I think it was just good to have it and, um, and have support by everybody in the, in the, on the team. And um, also, it gives users clarity of, of, of what the bot is collecting. Um, well, now, imagine you are talking freeform with the bot. Um, it's, uh, it makes a really, really a big difference if you are talking with some type of persona or you're talking with a, with a sort of characterless machine. Having a persona to talk to is, is not only like a brand gadget or nice thing to have in terms of, um, whoa, I'm, I'm talking to Kim and not a bot, but it also triggers a lot of psychological things that happen in your head. It, for instance, it makes it really, really a lot easier easier for users to identify with the bot and then help the bot out and um, out of, of situations where the conversation might have been stuck. So for instance, if things go, go a bit off the rails and, um, and people are, are aware that they are talking with Kim, they are much more willing to, to, to say things again in a different way and, and, and be helpful to the bot. So this triggers a lot of a lot of um, behaviors in humans that they would usually have some, some maybe in, in conversations with kids. It's, it's a very similar thing. Um, yeah, beside just chatting and, and texting back and forth with simple messages, I mean, one of the really cool things about the Messenger platform is the richness of, of, of content templates. We've, I think we've seen those. But um, also, <coughs> I mean, we, we've seen some... Yeah, we use some, some templates here to, to display um, articles about um, how to prepare ingredients, but um, sometimes just things within the messenger aren't really enough. So um, we've also seen the, um, the, um, um, the, the web view before, but we can also use this for, for a lot of different things. In this case, we use the web view for, for displaying long-form articles that you don't really don't want to push really long messages into the, into the thread. So you can just open up the web view and show an show article about some ingredients and, and users can then go back to the, the, um, to the chat again. We also use the web view um, later on. I, I'll show that for, for e-commerce, but um, maybe um, a t takeaway message here is that you can really be creative in how to use the different, um, different content templates or, um, or things that um, are available on the platform. <clears throat> and you can, maybe it's, um, it's just a starting point. I mean, you get a lot of examples on what to do with those templates, but if you, if you um, consider them as sort of a, a building, well, building material, you can come up with a lot of ideas what you can do with them. Well, a conversation shouldn't be just a, a way to, to go from, from a first contact to one, I don't know, 
video that you show the user or one transaction that you make, but it should be an ongoing thing that you can, can activate and keep alive. And um, so if you think of this in, in terms of um, um, a list of different user stories that you're doing within the bot, then you can always conclude one user story with an incentive to go on for the next one. So, so if, um, if you are going through a conversation about a recipe, and telling a, a user what they can cook with eggplants and onions, as I said before, then maybe afterwards you can go on with uh, stuff of um, do you need help with preparation or you maybe want to, want to buy the ingredients online or if someone asks uh, how to prepare a certain ingredient, you can go on with do you want a recipe for those ingredients. So, so you can keep the conversation alive and go um, and try to connect those different user stories and, and, um, and keep the user engaged with the bot. Meaningful integrations is <coughs> obviously, in this case, um, one of the um, things that if you th think about brands like Maggi who are introducing this coming from a, from a sort of content marketing perspective, then they never really had the contact with the, with the end users who are buying the stuff at Rewe or, or other retailers. In this case, the bot opens up a means of getting those interactions and those connections like more directly connected. And so in our case, we have users who talk about recipes and find out about ingredients. And what would be easier than to exactly, can you hear, see, I want to buy them and then directly connect the shopping cart for, e for an online retailer like Rewe and put all the ingredients that you just uh, found needed for that recipe into your shopping basket. So these kind of things make are re really useful. They offer a service for the for the user, and and I mean, currently we are working to, to improve this and um, and make um, and make memorable uh, make make it memorable for the bot to remember what kind of recipes the users liked in the past, what kind of ingredients they liked. So so y with a with a continuation of usage, the user would then get into a into a habit of, of using the bot for a certain for a certain uh, tasks like. Um, shopping groceries, which is something um, where, where a brand like Maggi can get into a, into a really meaningful position with the, with, the, with the users. Well, and then there is this conversation that goes really beyond the decision trees. And what we find out is that a lot of bots fail when you ask them questions that are a bit off topic. So asking questions like, um, how many calories are in there? Or for how many people is that recipe? And especially if you if you are going um, like really language heavy, like with references and not even mentioning the recipe and, and using just like these references, um, like for how many people is that? So these kind of references, language questions towards something that you've just presented. This is highly contextual. This is something that I would say is, is not something you would probably do within your first bot building on, on one like chat fuel or so, but this is something if you are trying to be really engaging and embracing the, the natural dialogue flow that what we are trying to build, then this is something where you find that it's sort of the long tail of conversation. So, um, so if you have users that really spend time in the bot, this is what they will discover when it's doing it and where they can, um, can pull extra value out of the bot. Obviously, it's, it's, it's sort of relationship building in a way as well. But no matter how, how good the bot is in the end, it will not be able to answer all the questions by the user. And so you have to think of how you integrate the bot experience with the, with the human experience. So using handover functionality and, and first realizing that a question cannot be answered by the bot and then handing that conversation over to a human, that is a thing that really um, integrates the bot experience with the general service, um, service quality uh, the brand is offering. But also, think of, uh, think of another aspect. The bot, and we heard this before, is, is always really fast and it's, re it's, it's a quick and immediate experience. How, no matter how good the, um, the support team is on the brand side, they would probably never be as quick as the bot. So you have to moderate this and, and tell the bot, well, now one of my human colleagues is taking over. Be patient. They're not as quick as I am. So you have to, you have to, you have to 
introduce people to this um, handover really, really um, um, explicitly because um, it's another maybe a takeaway. Um, people have to know whether they're talking to a bot or to a human, and um, this is one of the most important situations where you have to let them know. Okay, that's my part. I guess um, we're well through. It, maybe you have time for one or two questions. No questions? Cool, over there. Um, um, it's hard to say. In, in our, I think a lot of bots are working really, really well with, with tapping and quick replies. Our bot is, is used uh, by a lot of people who really type questions because it, it tends to be... Um, you can transport a lot more, more information with this. When I say I want a recipe with onions and tomatoes but without cheese... And it should be Italian. It would be really hard to do that with, with buttons, right? But if you do it with language, you can get to, a, to a, just a result like that. But um, in some situations, for instance, in onboarding, um, when, when a user goes um, through the bot for the first time, we use a lot of quick replies and, and extra messages just to let them know where they are, what they can do in that situation. And, and um, that's, this is really helpful. One more? Is there anything like... Oh. Is there anything like um, messenger analytics? Um, does Facebook provide that? Or do you oh, yes, that and I think the there database? is a talk coming up, and I cool. um, highly, highly um, yeah, um, suggest you, you do this. And it, it's good. It's, uh, we used it from day one on, and um, it helped a lot. One more? Sorry? sorry? A session on Facebook Messenger, is it like a 30-second thing or a five-minute thing? What, what, what's, what do your average users spend interacting with the bot? Um, in terms of time? It really depends on, on, um, on the, the beginning. Um, we found out that there are users who are just starting with the wrong foot. They don't really get into the flow, and then they will have a very short conversation of maybe three or four messages, and they're out. And then you have other messages, who, uh, other users who are, who are working just really perfectly with the bot where you have sometimes conversations over a few minutes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's a bit half and half. Okay. Okay. And depends, uh, for some reason, it also depends, uh, it depends a bit of time of day. Yeah. Yeah. Time. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, I think we'll hand, hand over. I, I have no idea where the time is. Um, what was the key challenge building this bot? So, for us, it was the first project. Everything was a challenge. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Semyon. I'm working here at Facebook in Berlin. Um, I'm a public policy manager focusing. Uh, besides many other issues on data protection, uh, that is one focus, and that is why I'm going to talk about uh, the general data protection regulation. Uh, but just as a brief intro, before I joined Facebook, I also worked as a data protection officer uh, in a Berlin-based small and medium-sized business, and before that for a startup as well in Berlin, uh, focusing also on data protection. And that company was called StudiVZ. I don't know if uh, some of you might remember. OK, I can see. Great. Um, so I was focusing on this issue from many different angles uh, in the past um, and started working on the GDPR in 2012 for StudiVZ. And now it's finalized. And I'm happy to be here to give you a brief intro. Um, it's just a, really a, a, a very brief overview of how the GDPR is working and how it's potentially affecting also your business. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the law is quite comprehensive and it's quite complex and difficult to understand and especially difficult to implement. But that's why I want uh, just to focus on some key aspects. But let's start with the past or... Um, the data protection framework we have right now in Europe and in Germany. That is the Data Protection Directive from 1995, uh, which is not directly applicable for companies. It needed to be um, 
uh, implemented by European member states into national data protection law. That is why we have, for example, in Germany, the Federal Data Protection Act, Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. And as you can imagine, uh, having 28 different data protection laws in Europe is quite challenging for companies like Facebook, but I guess for every digital service which is operating throughout Europe, because you need to be compliant with every single data protection act, act in each country. So um, that is one reason why the European Commission uh, in 2012 thought about a new data protection act. The other aspect, as you can imagine, if you think about data processing in 1995, that was really totally different in comparison to now. I think that's obvious um, because over two decades technology developed. So um, that is why the Commission introduced the General Data Protection Regulation, which is directly applicable. That's the most important aspect. There are some exemptions. I will um, refer to one exemption um, in the course of a presentation. But in general, it's directly applicable for every uh, company which, is operating, uh, offer, uh, which offers services to European citizens. And most importantly for you to bear in mind, of course, is um, it takes effect on May 25th, uh, 2018. So uh, there's quite some time, but not too much. What is the data protection uh, regulation focusing on? Of course, the protection of personal data. Um, and that is why this is uh, uh, the scope of the data protection um, uh, regulation. And what does personal data mean? Um, the regulation defines this as, as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. An identified natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly using all means reasonably likely to be used. So, as you can see, this is really, really comprehensive. And if you're processing personal data, you're definitely covered by the GDPR. In general, um, it's prohibited to process um, personal data, but there are some exemptions. And that is, for example, if you have consent by the user, or as the GDPR is saying, by the data subject. And that is, uh, I think, the most known legal ground for processing personal data. For example, if you um, start to use Facebook, um, you have to give us the consent uh, that we are allowed to process your data for the purpose of offering you the service, which is the social network. Um, there are other legal grounds which are less interesting uh, for you, I think. That's why I will focus on consent. But I just want to mention one other as, uh, legal ground that's legitimate interest. So for direct marketing, for example, GDPR says it's okay to process the data um, without having consent because you as a company will have to do an assessment, a legal assessment. What are um, the interests of a data subject and what are the interests of your company? And is it balanced? Is it okay to process the data? And you need to have this assessment ready if a data protection authority is asking you uh, to show your assessment. In, in the case of direct marketing, this is another legal ground you can use, but most often you will have to deal with consent. That's why um, I want to focus a little bit on one, when consent is compliant. And these are the requirements for a, co a compliant consent process according to the GDPR. So um, one, I will not focus on every aspect because that will take too long. Some are very clear, I think. But for example, the consent needs to be freely given. That means um, that, for example, you can ask can't ask um, the data subject to provide, for example, if you have a mobility app, something like Uber, and you, uh, you're, you're asking the data subject to provide also the, uh, the data of your uh, family, that is not okay because it's not necessary for the service. You just need uh, the data of the data subject you're working with. So um, that is what is meant by freely given. Um, it must be specific, of course, and most importantly, and that is quite often a challenge, it needs, it needs to be informed. That means you need to mention who is the data processor, who collects the data, to whom are you giving the data, is there somebody else, a third party, another company you're working with. And uh, that could be quite a long list, which is often criticized by data protection authorities on the one hand and companies on the other, because it's very difficult to strike the right balance. 
uh, and um, yeah, have clarity about when is the user informed. Do we need to give him all the information, or is it maybe easier for him to have the most important information of what is happening with the data? So this just to give you, or well, maybe one other aspect, because it's important, it's of course explicit. For, so that means the user needs to take an action to give you consent, clicking a button, checking a box, or something like that. This is, that's not nothing, uh, that's nothing new. Um, it needed already to be explicit. So if you have consent, um, you still have to deal with some other implications by the GDPR. And I wa just want to give you an overview of what is changing in comparison to the current data protection framework in Europe. So one thing is the territorial scope. So far, if your company was based in the European Union, you needed to comply with a directive or the national data protection law. Uh, if your company was based, for example, in Singapore, in the United States, or somewhere else, um, you, you were not, um, you, you didn't need to um, comply with the data protection uh, law in Europe. This is changing now. So that means if you're offering a service from uh, for, uh, from the US or where else, it doesn't matter as long as you are offering a service to a citizen of a European Union or a user within the territory of a European Union. And then it doesn't matter where your company is based. That is changing. Um, as I said, I will not go into the details of every aspect, but some other important aspects. Children's consent. Um, there was quite a discussion um, at the European level then children's consent was negotiated. That is why the GDPR is now providing um, a frame uh, of when it is okay to process children's data. And they said member sh uh, states should decide. It could be between 13 and 16. And that is why Germany, for example, said consent by children is just okay above the age of 16. Austria just passed a law and said, okay, it should be 14 because they compared it to their uh, National Civil Act. Um, and other countries, um, like some Scandinavian countries, um, Ireland, UK, are passing 13. And now you can already see the challenge if you're having a service which is operating throughout Europe because it's difficult. For us, for example, it will be okay to process data of people who are older than 16 in Germany, but in Austria it's okay, same language, to process data with the age of 14 above. So that is quite a challenge and uh, that is something uh, the regulator, regulator will need to work on because that is also a challenge for every service you might have, every startup. Um, the right to be, uh, no, the right to data portability, that's also something new, um, that's something we already implemented. That uh, says basically that you need to offer the user the possibility to download all its data and transfer it to another service. So for Facebook, that means if somebody wants to use another social network, the person can uh, download all its data and take it to another social network. That is uh, the right to data portability. And just very briefly um, on data breach, that is interesting uh, because you are required to inform, if you have a data breach, you are required to inform A, the data protection authority that a breach happened, and B, in some cases, you also have to inform the user that a data breach happened and their data are affected. Um, that is all I want to say about GDPR, and to make it a bit more complicated, as it already is, there is a new regulation on the European level, that is the e-privacy regulation, which used to be a directive in the past. And uh, the European Commission proposed um, uh, published a proposal in January 2017, uh, which is also covering data processing. It was aimed at messenger services, so we just talked about messenger services, and it starts regulating how data in a messenger service are allowed to be processed. And that is something you should have an eye on because that's um, probably will be passed at the end of this year. And as I said at the beginning, the GDPR is t uh, taking effect in May 2018. So have, we have two legislations, one is which is passed and we are working on, and there is another one coming, uh, which is again negotiating the same, more or less the same aspects because there are some, quite some overlaps in the e-privacy regulation. So that is just something I want to mention. And that is everything. Thanks a lot.
Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Woo! Hi, everyone. My name is Momo, and I lead partnerships for the identity team at Facebook. I'm really excited to chat with you today about the first touch point a business can have with people. So many of you here today are not only business owners and developers, you're also consumers. So I want you to think about the first interaction you usually have with apps or websites. It's usually the sign-up flow, right? Yeah, the sign-up flow is usually the first touch point that a business can have with a potential customer. And it's a really important it's a really important first step into your product, but it's one that uh, comes along with many considerations when you're guiding someone else to make the decision to take that step. So what exactly does this mean for your business? You're probably already thinking about how to make it easy, how to make it easy for people to use your, your product for the first time, how to make the first impression count, and how to provide an experience that attracts people back. So at Facebook, our team set out to really understand these challenges so we could better connect, better help, we, can, we could help businesses and people better connect. So before I delve into the Facebook core solutions that help address these needs, I wanted to share a little bit more on the research insights that really inform our understanding of the login landscape. So this is really important to us. It, it guides the way that we build our products. So we hope that these discoveries will jumpstart your thinking about how to improve your sign-up flow and how to better reach your audience. So results from our recent survey consistently inform us that convenience is the top in, uh, is of top importance. People also really care about being able to control what they share, and they want to trust that their information is safe. So many users have actually provided feedback that passwords get in the way of convenience. Think about it. How many times have you forgotten your password? Right? How does it make you feel when you forget your password? It's horrible, terrible, right? So we hear the same things from our customers in research time and time again. And guess what? Passwords are not just a people problem, right? Requiring a password means that businesses need to put systems in place to make sure that those passwords are secure and stored correctly. This is super important for businesses and developers, especially for liability reasons. So it's really clear that convenience is of utmost importance to users. And we've also talked about the pitfalls of passwords. Now let's find out a little bit more about login preferences. So a 2016 study by Login Radius shared that almost 93% of consumers prefer social login over traditional email registration. This is because, again, they often forget their passwords. Um, and when they do forget their passwords, they don't bother to recover them. Right? They uh, forget their security questions, and they end up just leaving. So we also regularly survey people around the world about their preferences for account creation and sign-in. And we found that Facebook login consistently ranks in the top three. However, again, there's a, a strong preference for email, and we're seeing that phone number is becoming increasingly important. So we've actually designed Facebook login and account kit with all of these things in mind. And we'll go into a little more detail about each product shortly. But at a high level, both, both Facebook login and account kit offer account creation and authentication. And it's worth repeating. While Facebook login is a popular choice, email and phone number are steadily becoming more important. So you can use both Facebook login and account kit to address these needs. All right, so Facebook login is a quick and easy way for people to create an account using their Facebook identity. 
It eliminates the painful process of having to generate a new password, a new username for all of the third-party sites you visit. So people, can, people around the world can log into your app with just two taps. It's really easy. Facebook login is the number one social single sign-on product in the world. And again, because we're able to log people in with just two taps, we're seeing over 350 million people log in with Facebook every single month, right? It's really easy. Now, Account Kit, on the other hand, helps people quickly register for an app using their phone number or email. Account Kit offers SMS-based phone number login. So let's actually take a quick demo. To, uh, let's take a, a look at the demo. As you can see, the Account Kit UI lets the user enter in their phone number. And then we'll send you a six-digit confirmation code the user will type that in. We'll verify or validate that code. And you're in. Okay? No password to remember. So as of today, we're working with telcos to support phone number-based login in 230 countries and regions. Account Kit currently supports over 50 languages for text verification, and over 20 languages for phone call uh, verification. And we also support sending SMS verification codes to over 200 countries. So just to name a few, here are some of the features of Account Kit that can be accessed on our developer site, developers.facebook.com. We can walk through these in more detail during office hours. So today, 1.5 million accounts are created daily with Account Kit, and it's growing quickly. So our top partners for Account Kit see conversion rates of up to 90%. And 97% of people entering um, an app through the instant verification flow see a 97% conversion rate. So with that said, by implementing Facebook login and Account Kit, again, which includes email and phone number, you can cover 95% of people's preferences for sign up. These two solutions give you the ability to reach your customers and help you focus on your core business. So let's take a look at two examples. So are you guys familiar with Treatwell? Cool. So Treatwell, uh, the new name for Wahanda, is Europe's largest online hair and beauty booking platform. It was founded in 2003 and it's grown from five employees to over 500 employees spread through, I think, 12 European offices. The company transitioned to be, being mobile first in 2014, and mobile now accounts for over 50% of their total bookings. In an effort to drive new customers to sign up to provide access to sections such as My Personal Profile and to offers, Treatwell integrated Facebook login. This allowed for the double benefit of an easy login, as well as an increase in app retention. And even though Treatwell customers don't need to log in to check out, a third of users now do. Moreover, customers who choose Facebook login end up spending over 20% more time in the app and more money with 22% higher order value compared to other login solutions. So let's look at one more. Familionet. Founded in 2012 in Hamburg, Familionet is a smart geolocation-enabled mobile app that answers the question, where are you, exactly when needed. The app gives people real-time information about the location of their friends and family, fully respecting their privacy at all times. The app has become hugely popular and is now used by over 1.5 million people in 16 languages worldwide. So to give customers a quick and easy way to access the app, Familionet integrated Account Kit phone number. Initially, the team rolled Account Kit out to 25% of their user base, to, uh, to 20,000 20, new users, and instantly saw great results. 
the global success rate for account kit based phone number verification was 78%. And Familionet increased its onboarding conversion rate by more than 40%. So with that, I want to just thank you for your time. And if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about Facebook login, and account kit, come and check me out at the booth. Happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Momo. Let's go a slide further. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the growth part, which um, Malte mentioned at the beginning. So once you have established um, or have an MVP out, established service, um, you want to grow that business, right? Um, and then you need to rely on um, partners on this, which could be marketing platforms around the world. I'm going to show you um, how Facebook is going to help you on this. Um, and before I start, um, the, I will split it into, um, into two, um, let's say, parts. The first part is like two trends um, we see among the platform um, which you should be aware of and which you should start thinking of um, right away. And um, the second would be I'm giving you a glimpse of our newest products. Um, when I looked at the attendant attendee list, um, I saw that like a lot of people are already working with our ads product, so I'm really going into um, what's new, not the generic stuff um, you maybe um, day by day or at least week by week already work with. So first of all, let's um, jump into some numbers to give you um, the, the, the sense of how big Facebook is and why it's an um, important platform to be on. Um, we have 2 billion um, users um, on the platform, um, on the blue app we call it, like Facebook, and then there's Instagram um, with um, 700 million. So um, especially on the Instagram side, this is we have huge traction on Instagram. So probably you will have like an announcement of 800 million um, users there within the next, that's roughly three months. Um, so these platforms are just huge. And to top that, um, like 20% of the time in the US is spent um, in Facebook apps when you're on your phone. This is like translated into 50 minutes a day on one of these two apps. Um, this is huge. And if you think about um, when you use these apps, um, it's usually in your spare time, um, not really for work. So it's a place for inspiration, discovery. Um, so this is important um, for the next steps. Um, first ads I'm showing you. Um, probably um, some of your ads will maybe look a bit similar. Um, but what we see is there's a shift towards video content, or at least moving content um, as, co as organic content as well as, of course, on um, ads. This shift is huge. Um, when you just remember last time you opened your Facebook and um, scrolled down the feed, how many videos you saw, you probably end up with like at least 60% plus um, this video. So if you do advertisement, you're going to compete against um, people who share videos, um, pages who share videos. So make sure um, you do videos as well, or at least like on the, on the right, you see an example of um, a slideshow where you like have es essentially stills, but you add on, um, or you add them, um, and you will have at least moving pictures. So this is the first trend. The second is um, when you're thinking about where to, where to get people um, and where to, sorry, this was a bit fast, um, going back here, um, where to um, like target people, it's always a question, mobile web versus app usually, but see it integrated. Um, like it's usually easier to get people on mobile web, but if you look at LTVs and engagement rates, um, mobile app will be always better um, than the web um, surface because it's se more seamless. Um, think about um, this when you try to get um, a new product out, app will be um, your driving um, force um, behind it. Let's jump in. Um, these are the two trends I wanted to mention. Let's jump in into um, our newest products. There's like four pillars um, I will look at. The one is like how to um, drive sales with existing and new customers, um, performance branding um, as a second pillar, the third going global, and then 
as like let's say as closing um, the circle um, measurement um, for growth. Um, this is all when you work with Facebook on the ad side. Um, make sure you test, learn, iterate, and begin again. Otherwise, you won't be um, playing um, on the edge um, with other um, with other advertisers because we launch products so fast. Um, you would need to uh, adapt to this um, speed. On the on the new products um, for um, the ads and grow existing and new customers. Let's take let's take a step back. Um, like let's roughly six seven years ago, um, it was easy, not really easy, but um, it was e it, it was easier to get customers by, for example, SEM. Um, there was a demand. People typed in a certain keyword into um, Google, and then you showed your ad. Nowadays, um, it's about like creating this demand because the let's say the easier models are not there anymore they take hellofresh one of my clients um, they're creating a market for meal boxes um, there wasn't a market for this before so they need to explain stuff they need to um, they need to d make people discover um, this new offer and how we're gonna um, help them to do that is like for example with um, the DA for broad audiences um, product. Um, you've maybe f DA, sorry for acronym, it's dynamic ads. It's our automated product for retargeting for e com companies. So you upload the product catalog and we then retarget um, or we choose the product showing to people who have been on your website. The extension of this is um, dynamic ads for retargeting. So as well automated way to reach people but now on the prospecting level so you we have the product catalog um, from you and we choose based on the um, signals we get from the people um, who to show what product um, to people who haven't been um, haven't been on your website before so this is huge because you need it before this product you need to do a lot of prospecting handwork but this is an automated way um, to do it this is one product I wanted to show you, and now comes the more, like, let's say, visual um, product. I hope everybody of you um, have seen um, Instagram um, stories already. Um, nowadays, Instagram stories, like, this is just a year old product, right? It's really new um, and exploding on um, the um, engagement on this. Oh, we see exploding engagement on this. There's like 250 million people um, using um, Instagram stories each day. And this is also, of course, a chance for marketeers um, to jump on this um, because this ad product, um, which is ads for Instagram stories, is just three months old. So meaning there's, a let's say, an um, opportunity window to leverage this um, till the time comes where like a Procter & Gamble, L'Oreal and stuff, they jump on it. But now they're just too slow. Be fast, um, jump on this product, the CPMs are low, you get the whole screen with your ad. The attention on these ads is huge, as this is a pretty new product. Um, you can see by the numbers down there, um, it has tremendous success. Um, so this is another new product. Um, I really encourage you um, to test um, with your um, services. On the performance branding um, part, usually, um, and this is especially in bigger corporations, there's always a brand team, then there's a performance team. But with our platform, um, we are like quite confident to say you can combine both. Um, you can try a sequenced approach where you have like first the branding aspect where you um, add more an emotional character, then you add the benefits or you show the benefits of your product and in the end you try to convince people to buy your product or to install an app. So see it not as distinct, um, see it together and um, we are happy to help you to set up campaigns where you combine both branding and performance because in the end, this like we we offer to you, you can um, like target one person, right? Um, and this one, this one person um, also in, let's say in the offline world, you, you, don't, have the, you don't have the control um, about this one person if it sees first the billboard or like some examples in a um, supermarket. Um, we can um, really help you to drive people down um, the funnel here. Um, a really good example um, how you can do it is this by using our carousel ads. Um, here's an example from Souk um, in, um, 
in Ni Mina, um, where you can see they started with like a really emotional touched um, card, and then they're showing um, their product. So this is a smart way of combining brand um, with um, a direct response um, approach. Last piece um, in the new products um, section is going global. On the going global, um, we help you guys to go global um, with certain products, um, and especially like the, the fundament of all of, it, all of this is, of, co of course, Facebook. Because we have global coverage, right? There's just one company out there which um, makes it um, similar easy to you um, to ex extend um, your, um, your service, for example, into new countries. First of all, it's like three parts here. Targeting, you can target like certain trade um, areas like the EU. You don't need to set up like France, Germany, um, Spain. You just can, um, or you just, you, you can um, really target this region in total. You can also do global targeting, which is um, sometimes important for brands like Coca-Cola. Um, I think the most powerful tool um, on this, and this is like, if you don't, get like the vocabulary I'm using, I'm at the booth later on, um, the, the um, look-alike audience um, on um, international look-alike audience, sorry for that, um, the international look-alike audience, you can really conquer, n conquer a new country within just three clicks because what we do is like, we use a seed audience, you provide us, let's say you wanna go, you, you do operate in Germany and you wanna open up um, in France. You give us your best customers from Germany and we will build a lookalike for people in France out of it. So you will have a head start um, in the country. You don't need to do interest-based targeting. You just use the best people um, in Germany and we will figure out um, the, let's, the people most likely to them um, in France. On the creative part, and this is really new, um, it has recently launched this. What you can do now is like within an ad set, you can give us, let's say, four different ads, each different languages, and we're gonna detect for you um, who to show which language in which, uh, uh, which ad in which language. So you don't need to work, uh, do this work um, on your own. We will do the work for you um, on this. The last piece, um, and again, I want to repeat this. Um, it's testing, learning, iterating, and helping you on this um, is definitely measurement, right? You need to measure the right stuff. Um, and we're talking about measuring the right stuff. This is now a look into the future, I would say. Um, don't kind of take this chart, take it with you, and think if you were really prepared for this. Um, what we think is like, it's not about clicks and conversions anymore. Um, some people are still in the clicks field, the conversions are already good. But think about customer lifetime value. Um, what does the, the campaign um, bring you on customer lifetime? So is it on the short term, a lot of registrations, um, fair enough, but um, you wanna have people who got engaged, who reorder. Um, so this is the first step if you think about um, measurement. Second would be the last click attribution is pretty much outdated. I know our competitors trying to force you um, to still work with this, um, but in the end, you need to have like a multi-touch attribution because the customer journey isn't just one click. It's like several clicks, several um, views before, and you need to consider this um, when you do marketing, especially online marketing, where you have a lot of data available um, to really look into um, a multi-touch attribution. And the last one on this, um, it's already pretty advanced if you do solid management, like a split test with us, where we um, just split audience and see what, how they behave. Um, but in the end, you need a holistic approach on measurement. So you wanna prove that, in an, that a campaign in May 2017 had influence um, in December. So really um, ramping it up the game um, is um, essential. I leave you with this, um, with the measurement part, um, and hand over to Matthias, who will give you um, insights on how you can do measurement um, with Facebook and the Facebook Analytics um, service. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm a bit disappointed. He told me he was gonna make a joke and he didn't, that's probably, that's probably better. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be the last um, 
person talking about a product today before welcoming Malta back to the stage for some closing remarks, and then we're going to move. We're going to move on to um, the office hours. My name is Matthias. I work on Facebook Analytics out of Menlo Park, our headquarters. Um, I actually used to live in Berlin, work at a startup like many of you. I see one of my ex-colleagues over there. Um, I lasted exactly three winters in Berlin. <laughs> California's weather is a bit nicer. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about Facebook Analytics and how we can help you measure the complete customer journey, whether that is on mobile, on web, on messenger, or other platforms. When businesses first start out, usually they focus primarily on acquisition, which is getting as many customers as possible to try your product. And that's great and really important, but we believe that it's only half of the growth equation. The other half would be retention. And if you aren't thinking about engagement and retention really early on, then you're likely losing a lot of people because of certain things that don't work as well within your product. That means that you acquire people, you lose a bunch of them, and just to be able to maintain the number of users you have, you're likely wasting a lot of resources and potentially money as well if you do paid acquisition. We know that both engagement and retention can be really difficult. The average app loses 77% of their users in the first week. And these stats are even worse if you look at monthly retention. We also know that about 60% of apps are used less than 10 times. This is one of the reasons we built a tool like Facebook Analytics and that we really care about using data to optimize products and to understand how people use those products. It's because we think that analytics tools can help you beat these stats that are really pretty bad and help you grow by using analytics in an intelligent way. So before we get into a discussion about the product that we have, I want to talk a little bit about the history and the evolution of analytics tools. Years ago, measurement was mainly desktop web-based and pretty rudimentary. You had the HTTP protocol that gave you a few metrics that you could play around with, but measurement was basically URL-centric, session-based, and relied primarily on cookies. Some products today are still built on this architecture. And then, about 10 years ago, with the growth of mobile devices, we had to adapt the way that we measure things. Cookies and URLs and those web-based sessions are not very useful in an iOS or an Android app. And that's why we changed the way we measure things by adapting to two new things, events, so being able to track user activity and the transactions that they complete, as well as the devices that they use. So this was already quite a bit of a shift from the web-based model, but in this world, you still have web and mobile. There are kind of two separate silos. This doesn't really reflect how people use products today. These traditional analytics tools measure cookies and sessions and devices, but the modern users are going to use multiple devices to be able to complete a certain journey as sometimes a single transaction. Thanks to our reach, and the identity graph that we have of over 2 billion people around the world, we can help you adopt a more people-centric approach where we can help you tie actions by to pe back to people and understand how they go from one platform to another. This is a view that is based on people as opposed to cookies or devices. We started doing this for mobile apps, then we added web and support for bots on Messenger, but Facebook became increasingly important as a channel to understand how customers interact with your product. If you don't really understand how your users of your app or your visitors of your website also interact with you on Facebook, you're likely missing a piece of that customer journey. And that is why we've added multiple channels. First, we've recently introduced, introduced support for Facebook pages, which basically lets you understand interactions and demographics of people who interact with your Facebook page on, on facebook.com. And we've also added support for offline conversions to basically help you take information and things that happen offline and bring it online and combine it with the things people do, maybe on your app and on mobile. This is why when we talk about Facebook analytics, we always try to talk about the entire customer journey as opposed to only focusing on iOS and Android on one side and on web, for example, on the other. So, as I just mentioned, Facebook page support 
allows you to understand the behavior and the demographics of the people who interact with your page. That means you can get more detailed information about when people like one of your posts on your page or share it, for example, but not look at it um, just from that perspective, but it's more interesting to combine it with other data sources. Wouldn't you want to know, for example, whether someone who shares your content on Facebook is a more valuable customer on your website? That seems like a pretty uh, intuitive thing to ask yourself. And with this support, you can start answering those questions. Offline conversions essentially allows you to upload offline data through an API. And then for all the users we can match on Facebook, we'll be able to create an event for you and show that in Facebook Analytics. Offline conversions can be used by retail stores and any other non-digital experiences to basically take those experiences online and be able to map the customer journey and combine it with other digital channels. So we think that those features mark the beginning of this third wave of analytics. It's a wave that we think is going to be more people-centric because we think it's really important to be able to understand how people will interact with you on multiple devices and multiple platforms at the same time. Facebook Analytics supports all these different channels and in the future potentially more to really help you understand all the different touch points that you have as opposed to the siloed ones that you had in the past. And it's a wave that we think is going to be focused on productivity. I'm going to talk more about this a bit later with a new feature where um, we've just released. But basically we want to make sure that our product helps you succeed by making some things really easy. I'm going to skip that. This is an overview of Facebook Analytics. It's a tool that is designed to help you grow by helping you understand how people interact with your product. As I mentioned earlier, it is something that supports multiple platforms. And what's really interesting about it is that you can combine them together. Not only you can analyze how someone uses your app on iOS and how someone interacts with your website um, on a laptop, but you can truly combine the two. And we'll go into more detail about that. It's also a product that's completely free. I thought that was pretty obvious up there. Lastly, I want to mention something that is a very common misconception about Facebook Analytics. It's a standalone product. What that means is that you don't need an ad account, you don't need a Facebook page, you don't even need to use Facebook login to be able to use all the features that I'm going to show you, um, and not even the things that are specific to Facebook, like demographic information. So there's a pretty simple two-step plan to be able to start using this product. And if you have more questions and you want to do things right away, we'll be here with the team after the presentation for office hours. I see the team there. They're pretty excited. They had a few club matches, so they're really awake. The first step is to install the SDK. Um, we have a Facebook SDK for iOS and for Android. And if you want to get web analytics, you can use our JavaScript SDK or the Facebook Pixel that you may already be using for ads. And the second step is to start logging events. These events are going to be the key actions that people take within your product or within your website that you want to keep an eye, that you want to keep an eye on. Once you have logged events, these are a lot of the features that you can start getting with Facebook Analytics. We're not going to talk about all of them in detail, but we're going to cover things like demographics, retention, funnel, funnels, and a couple more. So let's start with demographics. It's probably one of the most interesting features of Facebook Analytics, and it's one that's really unique to Facebook. Facebook Analytics provides rich demographic information about your users in a way that is aggregated as well as anonymized. It's particularly useful to understand the types of people using your product and measure how well each segment of people that you can create yourself are doing um, based on the key metrics that you want to track. So this is an example of what the demographic section can look like. Facebook Analytics includes funnels. Funnels are going to be these sequences of steps that you may want to track within your product to, to be able to track certain conversion flows. These funnels are going to be based on the events that you log, so it's really important to be thoughtful about what to log there. You can use funnels to track the most important flows that you have in your product. Those can include things like the onboarding experience that a first-time user goes through, or the different steps that lead to a purchase on an e-commerce website, for example. This is what funnels look like. Because Facebook Analytics lets you combine all these channels that I mentioned earlier, it's really easy to create funnels that start on mobile and finish on the web, for example, or vice versa. So what you see on the screen is a funnel 
of people who have installed your app, then visited your website, and bought something. This is an example of a funnel that you create really easily because you're using Facebook Analytics both, both on mobile and on web. And what's really interesting is that you can create this funnel and understand how people move from a platform to another, even if they're not logged into your service, since this rely on our identity graph and we're able to match um, those different actions on different platforms. I'm not going to give you the entire description of what Treatwell is. Momo did that earlier. But Treatwell also uses Facebook Analytics. And it's a great example of a company that used funnels to be able to improve conversion rates, in their case, through retargeting. So what Treatwell did is create funnels to look at how people behaved through their main um, booking flow. And they basically noticed that they had a huge drop on Android specifically for people who um, search for certain things but never added something to cart. So they were able to create a segment of people who had performed the first action, so searching for something, but never actually came close to completing that booking and that purchase. They created an audience for that. They targeted those people directly. And they were able to improve the conversion rate by 5%. So Treatwell is a good example of a company that both used Facebook Analytics to identify something that could be tweaked in their product and to be improved, as well as understand the impact of the campaigns that they run as a result of the first insight. Facebook Analytics also helps you understand retention and basically how many people come back um, on your product after the first time they discover it. This is what um, the retention chart looks like. You can look at the average retention rate for a given period of time, as well as look at individual cohort dates. What that means is that you can choose a group of people who, cho who joined your group, um, your product, sorry, on a given date, and then be able to look at how they came back over time. You can look at this retention on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis, and you will have a J-curve like the one that you see up there, as well as a chart that gives you all the different values and that acts as a heat map, where the darker blocks are going to be the days of higher retention. The one thing that is really interesting about Facebook Analytics um, is that we have this concept of segments, which essentially ha are these filters that you can use to create subsets of of users and be able to look at that specific group and how they've performed. Um, what's cool about segments, and you've seen it in other videos without me having to explain it, um, it's that you can use it throughout the product. So when I showed you this retention chart, we showed you a segment applied to them. So we're basically looking at the retention of just a small group of users as opposed to everybody. This is an example of a, of a segment, and it really shows you how simple it is to, to create those. You can create segments based on different types of conditions. Those can be the events and parameters that you log, as well as demographic information that we provide through the tool automatically. These segments can be used on funnels, on cohorts, and used pretty much throughout the tool. So you can really understand how the groups of people that make sense to you perform for the metrics that you care about the most. These segments can also be used for custom audiences. So if you use a segment to identify either a really valuable group of customers or a group of people that struggle through a certain sequence um, through your product. You can use custom audiences to either leverage the ones that do really well to create lookalike audiences or take the ones that don't do so well and retarget them to maybe help them go through or help them come back and try your product once more. Music Smash is a company that we work with that uses segments a lot and that basically help them improve their retention rate pretty significantly. So Music Smash is an app that allows you to look at lyrics of songs that are playing on your phone and be able to detect what song it is automatically. What they saw was that the segment of users who use their floating lyrics uh, feature, which is basically a feature that lets you um, automa have the lyrics automatically scroll while you're listening to music on your phone, they noticed that those people had a much higher retention than other groups. And what they did with that information is tweak their onboarding flow to try to get more people to use that feature. And what they saw was an increase in 20% of retention for those who ended up um, opting in. The last feature I want to talk about is automated insights. This goes back to what I said earlier about productivity and how one of the focuses on, of the Facebook Analytics team is really try to build a tool that makes it easier for you to get insights and then to take action based on those. Automated Insights is something that we launched in beta at F8, our developer conference, this year in April. 
if you are already on Facebook Analytics, there's nothing you have to do to start um, getting access to this beta. The only threshold is that you need to have at least 10,000 daily active users, either on mobile or web. And if you do, you'll start having these ranked insights in the form of cards that you see at the top on the overview page of Facebook Analytics. In this example, we show you how a group of users based on an app version perform better than the rest of the user base. So these insights essentially help you understand different segments and get a sense of how those perform relative to the rest of your user base. It's something really in we're really excited about because it leverages a lot of the machine learning and AI stuff that we build at Facebook and basically apply it to the analytics space to be able to surface insights automatically for you because we know that it's a, it's a part of working with data that consumes a lot of time. There's already over a million apps, websites, and bots on Messenger that use Facebook Analytics. I encourage you to give it a try. It's something that is free. A lot of you are already set up with our SDK and or our Pixel, so it's really simple for you to um, get on Analytics and basically look at the data that you're already logging with us and how you can use those insights. If you have any questions, feel free to come see us. There is Andrew and Chris over there who are also on the team that will be joining me at the booth. We're happy to look at your setup live if you came with your laptop or try to answer any questions. If you already use the product, we're also really looking for feedback about how you get value about the product, so that's information that we can bring back to the team that is in, in Menlo Park and in Seattle. To learn more and to get started, if you haven't used the product yet, you can just go to analytics.facebook.com. Um, the website has, has different guides and different helps to be able to assist you throughout the process if you want to do everything online. So I think we have a little bit of time. So before I call Malta back, we're going to take a few questions. I think some folks had questions about analytics before. So we're going to take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, Anyone? Sure. There's a mic over there that I think we can bring to you. If you could tell me your name and where, where you uh, work, that'd be uh, awesome. I, my name is Henrik. I work for State Friends, the other social network in Germany. <laughs> and um, I am interested how you can track advertising campaigns besides Facebook campaigns through Facebook Analytics. Okay. So for, for Facebook campaign, it's, it's pretty much built into the product, so you have the ability to... Um, segment based on a campaign, an ad creative, an ad set, uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, for attribution data that comes from outside of Facebook, we have a feature that is called user properties that essentially lets you set a user ID with RSDK, and then based on that user ID, join data that is not available um, in that client, so it can be data that you have in your CRM or that you capture somewhere else and we're able to join it based on that user ID. One of the ways that companies can use user properties is to pass attribution data that doesn't happen on Facebook. Um, that, is, that is pretty much the only way you have to do that today. Hi. Uh, hey. what's, what's the... Um, oh, Sam, by the way, uh, get your guide in Berlin. Um, I just wanted to ask what A-B testing looks like with Facebook Analytics. C can you be more specific? Well, as in, if you also you talk about a cohort for a campaign that you're running, and you want to know, uh, maybe you want to expose that to 50% of those uh, of those users, mm -hmm. and you want to see the, you know, comparison, an A/B comparison. Uh, so funnily enough, you can use user properties for that as well, but there, <laughs> it's it's not the only feature that we have. Um, you can basically pass um, different types of information, whether you want to pass it with events and parameters or with user properties. Those are two different ways you have to tag which group a user is in. And then you can use the segment builder to, uh, you can save those segments that I showed earlier. So if you want to, to simplify the test, have a group A and a group B, and then simply apply each segment to retention to see how it differs, you can do that pretty easily. Um, for some of the charts that I showed at the very beginning, like active users and a few other of the line charts, you can even apply two segments directly on the same chart because we know that a lot of companies will look at them one after the other or export the data and then recreate those charts on Excel, for example. So we let you do that directly in the interface. Cool. Thanks. There's a question over here. Um, hi, I'm Micha from 10 Miles. Um, I have a question. You showed the, the retention thingy before. Um, is it possible to 
define like certain elements or maybe can you explain how this retention is calculated or can you just define by yourself what does it mean retention for a certain company? Yeah, so um, we have retention is just one of the types of cohorts that um, you can get in Facebook Analytics. It's the one that we create automatically for everyone. And the way it's defined is we take a new user, so the first time that a user comes to your product, and then any, we basically map it against any next visit that they have. So on, on mobile, that specifically will be the app install as the first event, and the second event will be any app launch. On web, it would be a first time uh, visitor, and then any page view that they do after that. We do have this notion of event-based cohorts, so if you want a different definition of retention, you can create those cohorts yourself. So you want to take, um, as the first event of the two-event cohort, you want to take a unique event. So you typically want to start with app install or first time someone shows up on your website. But if you want to use a different event as the, the retention driver, so to speak, you can do that. Some people want to look at how um, purchases behave, evolve over time, and they can create a cohort based on that. For purchases, we actually have recently started creating those automatically because it's a really convenient way to look at lifetime value pretty quickly. But if you have other events that you think are better indicators of retention and you pass those events to us, you can create cohorts for them. Yeah. I think we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions. Yep, I'm here. Hey. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit, no, no offense meant, but uh, I'm always a little bit scared of Facebook because Facebook really likes exclusivity. So actually, I'm, uh, I'm wondering here, can I use um, those analytics with Google Analytics, with Sumo, all at the same time, so I can have a period to compare? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the companies that we work with use multiple tools um, side by side. And there's information in here and insights that are going to be Facebook specific or, or that are going to leverage some of the Facebook strengths that you're not going to be able to find elsewhere. But there are other tools that maybe will provide you insights that you care about that you don't have in Facebook analytics. And it's, it's not uncommon that companies use a bunch of these tools side by side. Yeah. Hey, uh my name is Akash from a Berlin startup called N26. Question is, can we bypass using the Facebook SDK by using something like Snowplow or Adjust? Um, yeah. Uh, I didn't get into the details of how you can log these events, but there, there are multiple ways to do that for each one of the platforms that we support, except for the ones where we log those events automatically, like Facebook pages. So if you take iOS and Android as an example, you can use the Facebook SDK for both of those. We have a native SDK in Objective-C and Java, but you can also use an MMP. So Adjust would be an example of a company that you can use to pass events to us, and you're pretty much going to get um, the same information that you have here. Um, there, are, there are reasons to use one or the other depending on what your setup is, um, but we, we have that. We basically have a server-to-server -server API as well because some companies like to build their own event collection mechanism and they just send us the event server side. That works as well. I'm going to take questions until oh, someone stops last me. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, will the threshold for 10,000 users stay or will you lower the bar or open it to all kinds of services, apps? We don't know yet in the sense that um, it's a product that is pretty new and that we're working on pretty actively. But it requires a significant amount of data to be able to show meaningful insights automatically. And that's the threshold that we ended up um, going with to begin, because that is a volume of, of data and of events that we think produces decent insights to start. But uh, it doesn't mean that it couldn't potentially change in the future. Cool. So thanks a lot for your time. I'm going to get Malta back on stage to close.